How's it going? Hi, good. How are you? Oh, good to see you. Yeah, successful keynote. Congratulations. Thank you. Natasha, Sp Spencer, you made it. Right. I made it, yep. Natasha sent me her email from this morning, and I got in right away, so I don't know what happened. Tosh always gets a special treatment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's my life. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, Nolan? Oh, well, good to see you, all of you. Um, I apologize. I've had so many emails, but I don't think we hashed out any any plan, right? Nope. nope. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, do you uh, want to have a point person in? introduce all of you or do you want to introduce like yourselves and then jump into it what do you guys prefer i think i mean we've got a bit of a plan uh, amongst ourselves we were i was going to sort of moderate a little bit and do the intros and then everybody's going to take five minutes and then um then we've got some questions that we're going to go through and then time for audience questions as well so perfect bit. yeah i've got some um some diversionary uh, slides as well, which I think are always helpful. Uh, okay. If I can share my screen, I'll get those up. Uh, I think Natasha had a long drum solo in mind too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, something very Neil Pert, right? I mean, I never give a paper without a drum solo at some point, so. Uh, you, are, you are all the panelists, right? Is there anybody else? Hmm. Not, not that I know of, but <laughs> there's, there's people. In the, there's people in the waiting room. I just want to make sure I didn't uh, um, let them in until you guys are ready. Uh, I'm going to um, jump out for a moment, and then I'll, I'll come back. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Right. Can you guys see that? All right. Yeah. So if he never comes back, then we're in some like Jean-Paul Sartre play, right? <laughs> like this is, this is, hell is, we're each other's hell, apparently. It's, how this is it's like, do we have a plan? I don't think I'd be talking to you like six minutes before it starts about my fucking plan. <laughs> Who are you guys? <laughs> now I feel very organized. <laughs> Man, I'm stuck back in the... Stuck back in the GIF. It's like making fun of me, the little tendrils coming out. Uh, I have um, a phobia of dots, um, like naturally occurring, randomly spaced dots. And there's some COVID um, images that give me heebie-jeebies. This one is borderline giving me heebie-jeebies if I yeah. stare at it. This is, this appears to be recording, just so you know. Oh, no. <laughs> there's, there's, there's actually a name for a phobia about holes. I can't remember yeah. the word. Trick, that's what I'm referring, what is yeah, it? Yeah, Trick -a. yeah. Trick Yeah, there used to be a couple particular images on Snopes that. Um, oh, God, I should not have Googled that, yeah. <laughs> that was really not intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why is this recording already? <laughs> that's that's part of the hellishness of it all. <laughs> oh, oh my god. <clears throat> Some stuff here. Oh yeah, there we go. Did Thad find that guy? I like that guy with the. Yeah, he was yeah. on the he was on the fence about the guy because he had another one, but it was like a plane, but the plane had a watermark, and I was like, "Why a plane?" And he's like, "You know, overview." And I was like, "Oh man, I no, <laughs> wow. I need something way more literal." <laughs> so and get and instead we get this anorexic Edwardian dude with. Yes, exactly. <laughs> He's like, that's there's all we could come up with. <laughs> there's, a, there's an image that screams colonialism. It's certainly right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if the panelists can take, or this audience can take us down on it. I'm ready. I'm ready. I think there, I think there are some people here possibly already. Uh, there's yes. three people in the waiting room. Yeah. yeah. Oh, does it count when it says participants? That counts the people in the waiting room. Oh, yeah. Wow. 
Mm -hmm. Damn, this is, this is more people in the room than mm -hmm. at a normal conference. <laughs> more than our media ecology uh, panel, oh, that's Oh, sure. that was so <laughs> sad. That, that was one of the more depressing <laughs> online conference things I've been to. Oh. Absolutely. Are you, are you, is your goal to go back and like subvert the organization or run screaming the other way? <laughs> Yeah, run screaming the other way. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, so much potential, but yes, and yet, <clears throat> and yet, yeah. It was kind no, of sad for Renee, though. You know, it was just like she thought she had this great idea, and then like two yeah. people showed up. Yeah. How many people were at the conference? Uh, A mean, couple hundred. Yeah. Yeah, it's about, I think, when I went to it a million years ago, that was a couple hundred people. It's very laddie, though, you know, they all know each other, and it's yeah. super laddie. Mm -hmm. but... Oh, okay. Oh, I can see who's in the waiting room. Oh, you can? Mm -hmm. Who's in the waiting room? Um, Michael D.D. N.A. Drake Jackson. Mm -hmm. How do you see that? If you click on participants, manage participants. I can. Oh, I see them. Okay. So right now we outnumber the audience. Yeah, three minutes. <laughs> we'll, we'll show them. Getting, you know, some coffee or tea before the session. Oh, you know, thank usual. you. Good idea. I'll be right yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We're never going to see Ralph again. No. <laughs> yep. Oh, I'll be glad when today is over. I mean, I'm excited to see some, some of these, but. Because you're presenting again, right? Yeah. Or... Yeah. Four, four o'clock. Yeah, but I'm, I'm like a very small part of that deal, so. Do you know what they're having for lunch at this thing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had a uh, women and gender studies meeting yesterday for, which is people across campus. But seriously, there was, there was one person who, like you saw the shot and they just had this bowl of noodles. <laughs> and they were like in really close and just <laughs> stuffing their face. <laughs> it was, it was actually. It's so really funny awesome. after all these. After all these months that I feel like people still don't understand, like, you're on camera. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fine if we're... Maybe they're too used to it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I saw some, um, something my wife was on, and one of the people on was a dean at her school, and her husband was, like, walking back and forth through the background carrying big baskets of stuff. It was very weird. It's very like, you know, I was waiting for him to show up with like no pants on and you know. <laughs> All right. <sighs> show on the road. Mm -hmm. So um I I expect that there will probably be more sad rock and roll news um in the next couple of months because just been inundated with sadly departed musicians. So, well, that's a lively tone to go in with. <laughs> <laughs> hey, most of them have had a good run. Wait, uh, are, is, hmm? oh. I was just going to uh, say that whenever you guys want to start, um, I give you guys all co host power so you can admit or remove people or, or do any of that stuff. Um, so, I'll, I'll be here listening and dealing with tech issues and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. But uh, it's up to you whenever you want to start. Okay. Yeah, and by all means, jump in if somebody says something really unfortunate. You you, you correct them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious, what made you think about rock and roll musicians right now? Like, is there um, something? No, I I I I I sarcastically quoted a Van Halen lyric in an email oh, earlier right. today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, somebody who was in the band Naked Raygun, which was a local Chicago punk band, died this week. So it's just been kind of and i just figure that at some point there's enough like 
celebrity musician, the, the world of celebrity musicians is so large that it's just going to be, you know, because they're all hitting that point now. Um, so. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to hit admit all. Should I do it? Yep. Imagine if you could do that at an actual conference, like make everybody wait outside until you're ready to go. <laughs> Very diva-like behavior. Right? <clears throat> Will somebody else keep an eye on that and then yeah. I'll Okay. I am, yeah, I'm trying to too. Okay. Great. Well, um, I've got half past, so I am going to get us going. And um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming to our panel um, today. Uh, we're hoping it'll be fairly interactive. We're going to take um, a few minutes to, to talk, and then we're going to have some questions and questions for the audience. Um, our title is Pandemic Critical Media and Information Literacy, Liberation or Return to Hegemony. And um, I'm going to start off first by just introducing everybody on the panel. Um, so we have uh, Ralph Bellavo. Um, he's the area head for creative media production and professional writing at the Gaylord College and affiliate faculty in both film and media studies and women and gender studies at the University of Oklahoma. He co-edited International Horror Film Directors, Global Fear in 2017, co-wrote Digital Literacy, a primer on media identity and the evolution of technology, and also has written about Network Society, Women in Horror, Documentary Rhetoric, The Wire, African American Noir, uh, Shelley, Shirley Jackson, and Paolo Freire and Media Literacy. So hardly anything at all. Um, Spencer Brayton is Library Manager at Wabonzi Community College and that's in Northern Illinois, and together with myself, um, he's uh, co-authored several articles in the areas of media and information literacy. He's also presented at or and served uh, in various capacities for the following organizations, the National Association for Media Literacy Education, the Canadian Association of Academic Librarians, International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, the Global Alliance for Partnerships on Media and Information Literacy, uh, United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, International Critical Media Literacy Conference, International Media Literacy Research Symposium, and the Association of College and Research Libraries. And he wrote that bio just to torture me, I think. Uh, Michelle Ciccone is the Technological Integration Specialist at Foxborough High School in Massachusetts. She's also affiliated faculty at the Media Education Lab at the University of Rhode Island and formerly a research assistant on the youth and media team at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And I'm Natasha Casey and I teach uh, media studies at a small liberal arts college in central Illinois. So that's the group today. Um, let me just give you a little bit of an overview of where we are planning to go. I got the introductions done. We're going to do um, speak for about five minutes each uh, on some themes and there'll be obvious connections, I think, between uh, many of those. Um, and then we've got some discussion questions that when we were thinking about uh, how we were going to go about um, uh, sharing our ideas with you. Um, we thought one, one way to do this would be um, if we had some base, basic discussion questions and then we'd sort of let the conversation evolve organically after that. And then uh, hopefully keep an eye on the time and we'll have uh, plenty of time for a little bit of audience interaction at the end. So that's our plan. Um, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I teach communications and media studies uh, classes at a small private liberal arts college um, in the Midwest. And when the pandemic hit Illinois, uh, we were given two weeks to pivot. And that is possibly the most irksome word of the year, I think. So pivot, in other words, move all of our classes online without a functioning platform. Uh, we literally have a system from the 1990s, and that's why I thought you would really have to see it in order to believe that that is happening. But there it is. So there are three main ideas for me that emerged uh, during and after that pivot that I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about this morning, and this is them in a nutshell. So the first one was, is, I think, and this is common to lots of places, the obsession with technology 
and equating online teaching with technology. Um, and this quickly emerged, at least um, in my institution, as the dominant discourse, especially in relation to issues of power and control. I think the rush to figure out how to keep students under surveillance while test taking, or how to be sure that they were really paying attention to online lectures if cameras were turned off, uh, as if online lectures are a good idea. And because, of course, um, students' rapt attention in the middle of a pandemic is really the most pressing issue. Um, but this kind of conversation dominated faculty conversations, um, policing the classroom really in the most uh, abhorrent ways. But perhaps that's not really all that surprising. Um, it's pretty obvious that the dominant culture of teaching at my institution and many institutions, I would say, uh, around the country and indeed the world, um, fall neatly into what Freire famously termed the banking methods um, and position the professor as an infallible authority. Um, and that's largely unquestioned, um, at least at my place. Uh, it's also true, I think, though, that uh, most of my colleagues really had very little experience or training and thinking through how and why pedagogies could or should be reimagined in distance learning uh, formats. I think uh, myself, I was a little bit luckier having attended some workshops and conferences online on online teaching in the past few years. And although most of the second half of last spring semester uh, was about support and survival primarily, since then, the pivot has really provided me with the opportunity to think through how my own pedagogical approaches have been usefully disrupted, challenged and reconfigured. And I think there still is room to creatively reimagine learning, um, and especially when we think about student choice, student collaboration, student agency. And that's why I'm a little bit surprised um, at the relatively little crossover between critical digital pedagogy influenced as it is by critical theory and pedagogy and critical media literacy. Um, both are essentially working under the same present uh, premise, which is understanding ideology and power. So um, I kind of want to use this opportunity a little bit to maybe call for a bit of an alliance between these two areas. There's so much in common and I don't really understand why we're siloed. Maybe um, it's just an awareness thing but we can talk about that later. So that's kind of my first uh, observation. The second uh, observation sparked by the so-called uh, new normal, another awful term, is related to that first one. Uh, online courses are prone to cultures of surveillance. Visibility is a pedagogical and ethical issue. And that's a quote from the Manifesto for Online Teaching, a group of scholars at the Center for Research in Digital Education at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, of course, in the opening um, this morning, there was already um, a, a extensive discussion on this topic. But I just wanna read you a quote from this manifesto, um, which was written several years ago now. Uh, quote, we suggest in our manifesto uh, that gathering extensive tracking data to see what is useful is not neutral. It has implications beyond the specific use and it ushers in an orientation to students as sources of data that can be unproblematically mined and analyzed in the interests of institutional performance and efficiency. As teachers, we need to confront the negative ethical and pedagogic aspects of creeping surveillance on campus and resist the uncritical assumption that the intensification of monitoring and tracking students is somehow inevitable. So I would just um, add a little bit to that idea of institutional performance and efficiency um, you know, those are the supposed interests in which this data has been gathered. I would say the surveillance culture is often made more palatable by wrapping it in a supposed pedagogy of care. You know, this idea that we're only looking out for the students' best um, interests. And for me at my place, it was really shocking how many of my colleagues uh, really failed to see students as uh, whole beings, um, whole humans. Um, and this again maybe ties the, the first two points together. So 64% of students at my college are first generation and supposedly baked into the mission of our work college is to serve students from traditionally underserved populations. Um, but only 16% of the faculty are first generation. And I think this, at least in part, helps explain the disconnect between the two groups. I think there's a failure to acknowledge their privilege and see how, uh, in addition to the obvious technological challenges faced by students when they left campus, 
there existed a myriad of um, other tremendous life disruptions, whether it was getting another job, dealing with parents, job losses, family members' sickness, looking after elderly, young relatives, all the rest of it. And I think this coupled with the loss of communities and networks, including convenient access to college student support services, such as food banks and counseling, all while anguishing over the cancellation of long awaited life milestones, such as um, graduating college. So I think this failure to see students as whole human beings obviously connects um, to the work of Paolo Freire, who said educators need to know what happens in the world um, of the children with whom they work. Um, and I think this is been a, re a real failing um, on the part of our education system. And then the last uh, idea I'd like to briefly touch on, because um, we're going to discuss it a little bit more later on, is this idea of institutional performative allyship. Again, something else that was mentioned in the opening remarks this morning. A journalist, uh, Ernest Owens, uh, wrote the following. While many have good intentions, true allyship, supporting black businesses, deeply exploring personal bias, and ferreting out ways that white privilege contributes to persistent racism, must happen in order to genuinely stand in solidarity with the marginalized and oppressed. And he argues that this kind of um, position really requires empathy, compassion, accountability, and humility. Um, and he said, I don't think allies in the self grandeur is useful for conversations around racial change. And I think self grandeur is really a helpful way to characterize these types of statements, um, like the one that was issued by my college and, and many colleges around the world, while really failing to address um, the systemic nature um, of racism throughout the college itself. So I'm going to leave that issue, um, like I said, we're going to come back to it. It's one of our main discussion questions. I'm going to leave it there for now and hand the baton off to uh, Ralph for his opening uh, comments. Hi. Um, it's, I, I think it's interesting in thinking about surveillance. There's two thoughts that occurred to me. And the first one is maybe a little bit silly. And the second one is, I think, pretty critical. For the silly one being... Uh, when you start talking and you haven't unmuted yourself, who's the first person to say, you're muted? So I think it's kind of a power grab weird thing that happens. It's one of those kind of weird Zoom realities. But the other part of it, and this is sort of like when the transition happened in March, when the pivot happened, um, the, the really interesting and, and, and very um, uh, uh, emotional discussion about, you know, what to do with students and their cameras, right? Um, there were a lot of people who thought... You know, first of all, that every you know, students have to turn their cameras on, and second of all, that they had to, and you know, the, in the more extreme, um, that people had to dress professionally, right? So there, were, there was all this bizarre kind of implicit surveillance stuff that was going on that I thought was really just kind of interesting, and it was more interesting to watch the conversation and then see how it fit in with what we were trying to do as we were, you know, trying to teach through this crisis. Um, Main thing that I wanted to talk about was the idea, and, and I guess we'll all get to talk about free area all day today because it's kind of grounded in that too. Um, but also some things about um, the way learning works that I think is interesting. When, um, and um, I am have very healthy suspicion about technology, surveillance, um, the, the idea that these are products and environments that our students are being put in that they are that, that they don't understand the politics of and we barely understand the politics of it and that needs serious interrogation and that's kind of mainly what I'm after is thinking about once we're in that situation what are the threats and opportunities in terms of media scholars how do we get our students to think about form critically about what it means for me to sit here talking to you and see myself and how does that affect students um, in, in terms of their participation, assuming, of course, that they're actually, you know, at a, that they have access to technologies that are sufficient to participate, uh, which isn't always the case. Um, but going back to uh, just a couple of ideas about how learning works. And so when the technology changes and we're not face to face or anything like that, when we have to anticipate what the implications of all of that are, uh, we're still, you know, with, we have the idea that wherever it is we're trying to, to, to uh, do and in interacting with students is it has to connect to them, right? Uh, it has to connect both to things that they know and the organizational structures they have in their heads uh, of how they know things. And um, it goes without saying that for a lot of us as interested in critical media literacy, that this is a two-way street, that what we know and our knowledge structures are also affected by how students interact with us during our um, 
class experiences. Um, and, and that's, I think, kind of a healthy thing. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very healthy to talk about all of this with our students, too, as they're kind of going through it. Um, so from Friere, we bring the idea and, and what I think of as a new fluid hybrid literacy, uh, that what they're thinking about what they know and how they structure that knowledge about using technology to communicate. And that was really eloquently discussed in the opening panel. I really quite liked what they were, how that was being framed by the, the people in the um, opening session. Uh, so thank you for sharing those ideas with us and, and kind of helping us move forward with this a little bit. Um, so then going ahead to the next slide, the goal um, in my head is that we need to make students aware of what they know and how their prior knowledge is structured in their educational experience and their media experience. You know, the idea that there's always this kind of renegotiated relationship between uh, the media sphere this, that they live in and the life world that they live in and how they interact with each other, you know, uh, should be a subject uh, in, in the classroom, in all subjects. Um, but that's, of course, always kind of a challenge, too. Um, we have to be sensitive, I think, to the fact that um, our students' lives are really unstable right now. Uh, and, you know, just in what Natasha was saying earlier, I think something that a lot of campuses lack, including mine, is sufficient uh, social and mental support services for students, particularly in a time of really high stress and anxiety. Um, given some faculty are actually, like, their response to this has been piling the work on, which I don't think is necessarily helpful. Um, but there hasn't been any kind of corresponding attention to the situations that students are having to work through. And I think that's something we need to, to be better at, be much better at than we've been. Um, they're having the same reactions as a lot of us are having. Exhaustion, I remember people posting things at the end of September saying, it's the end of September and it feels like Christmas break, uh, just because of the amount of, of extra anxiety and, and work that was going on with us. Uh, frustration with the technology, fear of just kind of like social and educational instability, and the students are experiencing that too. And, and again, most of us are, I think, attuned to that, but it's something we do need to pay attention to. Um, of course, the, 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 the clue here, and this goes back to the Fourierian idea, is one of the things we need to be doing is helping our students deserve better mastery over their circumstances, and that means learning how to critically interrogate the technologies that they're um, often uh, being forced to use because they're the existing technologies that work. Um, so, you know, that means thinking critically about what do these forms mean? Um, what does it mean to share screens? What does it mean to uh, that some people have better internet service than others in terms of how they are able to consume what we're maybe trying to get them to look at and, and critique? Um, and, you know, all of that goes back to the idea of trying to keep in mind the goal is the combination of what they know and how they know it, which to me has always been kind of the key underneath media literacy is taking a step back from the content and looking at the form. Uh, and so then what we want to do through all of this, and this is kind of where I'll, I'll close this up, is uh, the idea of how we can help them to learn how to remain critical no matter what the changes are in the form or in the content, that, that they always have that toolbox that they can use um, to approach technological changes, changes in class formats, whatever, and maintain a critical perspective on it. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ralph. Um, Michelle, you're up next. Yeah. So um, as the four of us were putting this um, together, Spencer and I kind of had a side conversation where we d we figured out that we have very um, there's a lot of overlap in our experience so we're gonna merge our two five minutes and do a ten minute reflection on some shared observations but before we do that we just we each want to give a little bit specifics about our specific context so um, like Natasha said at the start I'm a tech integration specialist at a high school in Massachusetts. Um, and because I'm a tech integration specialist, that means um, I, um, I work with other faculty, other teachers, and also work with students. So um, it's kind of a, a dual, I have dual audiences that I'm working with. And we're back in a hybrid format. Um, so there's some, um, there's kids are in the school two days a week and at home three days a week. Um, and just, um, I, just to reflect, I struggled to find my footing within my school before the pandemic. And um, basically from the very start, um, I, as I reflect, I'm continuing to struggle 
to find my footing. And it's a moment when it feels like as a tech integration specialist, like, oh, I should be in on all the conversations and like be leaned on and I'm really not. And so there's, um, you know, there, there's a lot of feelings that come up with that, this, these feelings of shouldn't I be needed more? And I'll let Spencer introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, so yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a library manager at a, at a community college in Northern Illinois. Um, and we have three camp, four campuses, three have, have physical library spaces. Um, and we've been back on campus in a limited uh, capacity. Um, while, um, of course, you know, continue to provide virtual support. Um, and the library has been playing more of a role um, supporting students with their technology needs, um, you know, both in the physical and virtual environment um, than we ever have before. Um, not only, um, you know, assistance with our learning management system, um, which we just rolled out a new one um, this fall, as well as um, making sure we're getting students um, the technology they need to participate in their courses. And then through all that, um, uh, Michelle and I had a, had a feeling of, you know, we kind of feel like imposters sometimes with our, with our work and, and, you know, trying to keep a foot in the, the crit critical, media, critical media literacy um, area um, because, you know, we, we were both in the classroom um, before um, and now we're sort of taking on new roles where we're trying to provide support um, um, to students and, and faculty and trying to bring that work um, through from, from behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Natasha. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Michelle and Spencer. So did you guys want to sort of yeah chat together yeah. for a little bit yeah. yeah go ahead yeah yeah um so if you go to the next slide um so in this um uh i there's like i guess three themes that emerged in our conversation about some of the overlaps in our experiences um first one being um a sense of techno solutionism like ha that has been mentioned previously um by natasha um uh, and we can see it in, in our roles, techno, a sense of techno solutionism really hurting students and faculty in pretty similar ways. And I'll just say, um, I th this is something as a tech integration person who who like you know has to interact with ed tech people. Like I really blame this on like the ed tech industry because ed tech has really oversold the promise of ed tech. Like it's going to solve all your problems and make everything great. And it's just. It's just not true. And now, um, now that we're in a situation where we are so reliant on these technologies, and I feel like I have faculty looking at me being like, I thought this was supposed to like fix everything. And I was, I'm like, no, it never was supposed to fix everything. I never believed that. But now um, we're sort of all been, you know, wishing that that lie was, um, was, was true. Yeah. And, and I think too, along those same lines, I've seen just a lot of different, um, technologies being thrown out there to solve those different problems um, or to solve maybe, you know, various communication um, issues uh, with students and faculty. And so, you know, um, whatever LMS you have, Zoom, Google Hangouts, Skype, Microsoft Teams, you can also create documents in Microsoft Teams and share those out and sort of, you know, group me is another one, you know, how are we reaching students? We don't know what they're thinking or, um, so we're just, we're, we're constantly throwing things and seeing what sticks. And I think that also contributes to, um, you know, students and, and um, staff and faculty alike, you know, they don't have the time to learn all these different tools either. And we're just kind of using them superficially. Um, and, and we're not sort of recognizing the labor that that's involved in, in learning these technologies and properly using them to their, um, the best they can. Um, and I think um, that leads to one of Michelle's ideas that she raised that, that we oftentimes hear that digital literacy isn't my job. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, but we expect employees to have some sort of foundational set of skills and, you know, what does that mean? Yeah. And I think as um, was brought up by the keynote and we expect students to have certain skills as well. And um, you know, I see this come out a lot in like digital organization, like even the use of like a calendar app. Um, I mean, and I, I get it, like my colleagues don't necessarily use a digital calendar, but even just something as simple as like get it, helping students get into the routine of putting things into their calendar. Like we used to do that when we were in school and had agendas, right? Like we had that 
that like spiral bound agenda. So it's the same thing. Like you, you help, you help your learners to develop these habits. Um, and like, are we, are we providing the same sort of um, support to develop these, um, these habits that will make you successful in this? I think, sorry. And I think too, we talk about, you know, those habits as, as something easy to pick up, you know, you do, you work on these things step by step and you will achieve, you know, a full understanding of, of that tool or that habit. And um, yeah, I found a quote to speak that from Doug Belshaw, who recently wrote, for me, people who package things up in a way that are too step by step are being a bit disingenuous. After all, I bet they didn't learn this stuff that way themselves. So he's talking about learning through frustration and, and you know, people maybe saying that digital literacy is not my job or that somebody else should do that and there should be a solution to it. That's not always, that's not always the case. Um, it, it can be a frustrating process to learn these things and that should be okay. Mm. I love that quote. I'm happy you pointed us to that. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess moving on to the second theme that emerged, um, we, we spoke about um, the lack of student agency and student voice in the creation of um, like these hybrid models that our institutions were creating. Um, and, you know, it's, we talked about the camera issue. Um, like, do you require students to turn their camera on? In my school, it is a requirement. I have, you won't be marked president unless you are. And it's just so funny to me working in a high school with teenagers and how many times have adults bemoaned the fact that kids these days they don't care about privacy. They put everything out there. Well, this is, this is a really concrete example of where young people are not wanting to put everything out there. And then that becomes a problem. And it's this very strange, like suddenly, everything seems a bit different. Another example um, that I, I shared with the group, um, my school, their um, contact tracing uh, strategy is to put up a whole bunch of QR codes everywhere. And so to track student movement, um, you know, you leave a classroom, you scan a QR code, um, you go into the bathroom, in and out, scan a QR code. And it wasn't until two weeks into um, having the strategy in place. I hope my system principal does not watch this recording, but only two weeks in was she like, I should probably see what this looks like on the other side. And I just thought, yeah, of course you should see the dozens of spreadsheets that you've just created of student movements. This is not a contact tracing strategy. And it's, you know, for years in my school, there's been a debate about, um, you know, should, should students be able to bring their phones to the bathroom? And it was always no, no phones in the bathroom. Well, now you have to bring your phone in the bathroom. And so like, what values did we really prioritize before? Or do we still prioritize those values? I don't, I would not argue that we prioritize that value, but now what? Next year, what do we do now? Can we, like, do we still care about this thing? And so I, I just, I'm reflecting on how, um, you know, the student agency, um, policing student agency um, is, uh, you know, it, it's coming out in very strange ways. Yeah, and, and broadly speaking to this, I, I often wonder um, if we provide students uh, with the same kind of technology support um, as we do um, to maybe employees or staff and instructors, because, you know, we have these centers, at least at, at in, in higher ed, we have these centers for teaching and learning or whatever they might be be called. Um, but I'm not, you know, I, I struggled to see um, that same sort of centralized dedicated support for students. Um, and I see that as being um, a gap at, at some institutions that I know of where um, it's just sort of picked up by somebody. Um, it's not, um, it's not any kind of strategy to help them. So I often wonder if that's, if that's one of the problems as well. And, and again, going back to assuming students uh, technology skills or what their needs are. Um, you know, I think another oversight is we, we many of us are not seeing them maybe communicate um, organically peer to peer in the virtual environment, helping each other. And that definitely is very apparent, at least at, at my institution, um, knowing where resources are, knowing where to get help. Um, and so I think that's, that's, also, um, that's also an oversight. Um, and then I often wonder too, in, in, in during this time, how um, in terms of being student focused, we always say we're, we're student focused, but how, how inclusive are we um, of the student voice um, during this time? I'm not sure that, that I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we're institutions that are trying to get student feedback and what that looks like, but 
I often I think that's oversimplified and we're not really hearing from a, a larger student population than maybe a, a few voices, maybe of students who have the, um, the privilege or the, the appropriate technology to part participate. Mm. Yeah, and then, okay, so then the final theme that emerged, we, we touched on this um, as both of us being support personnel, um, we're sort of integral to what's happening right now, but feel on the fringes um, and maybe in different ways and having this imposter syndrome. Um, I'm, so, um, you know, I think this manifests in a few different ways for both of us. Um, I, think, I think for me, I'm really reflecting on, um, you know, as, as a tech integrationist, um, I sometimes have to help implement technologies that I don't really, I don't really agree with. Like I, I would, if I were in charge, I would not have paid thousands of dollars for Turnitin. And yet I just had to spend hours um, helping to integrate Turnitin with, uh, with Microsoft Teams. And the whole time thinking, I wish we could talk about plagiarism with students in a different way rather than using a plagiarism checker. And um, it's very, it's a very strange like in between hybrid feeling of like representing the institution, um, but not really having a seat at the decision making table at the institution. And right now it's like, it feels pretty, it feels even ickier. And I feel like this, um, in larger systems as well in k-12 i'm extremely disappointed that um, the department of ed is not going to waive accountability testing requirements this year so not only will standardized testing go forth in the spring but we're going to have to make up the tests that were that were missed last spring so it's already a shortened year it's already you know kids are already in the building half the time and we're going to lose hours, weeks of instruction because of these silly tests. And so, yes, it's all well and good for me to talk to my colleagues and think about, well, can you can you get creative? Can you do this and that and think outside the box when they have these standardized tests breathing down their necks? And so, um, you know, it's so th that imposter syndrome of yes, I believe in critical media and digital literacy, and yet there are real boundaries that you know we have not reimagined. There are so many things that are not reimaginable right now. And um, that feels icky. Yeah, and along those same lines, you know, we hearing about sort of privacy and surveillance with proctoring software. Mm -hmm. And here I am, you know, working to support students with technology and trying to figure out um, how we're gonna get laptops to students with the appropriate proctoring software so that they can take their tests off campus. And so, um, one of those sort of things, intricacies that I, you know, internalize and, and struggle with, um, you know, during this time. And um, I think, I think also um, in our, in our move to online provide more sort of robust um, library support is, you know, teaching to a database, right. And using that company name um, with students. So they understand, you know, what, what tool to use and, and how to use it um, to do their coursework and, I think, you know, from, from my perspective, what I'm seeing is, you know, we're using industry names um, of these tools. Um, and uh, we're, all I'm thinking about is, is who owns who and how there's less and less of these database and library system companies um, buying each other up and at the same time charging libraries and institutions with dwindling budgets, um, you know, more and more, you know, money each year um, um, for access. And then I think as well, um, one last point I, I just want to make is you know, we also are talking about OER right now when we don't really have it, which is important, um, but we don't have a grasp on maybe the, the basics for a lot of us um, as we, we move down line. And I think we often blur the lines with inclusive access, which isn't, um, which isn't OER. Um, and, uh, you know, it's is, is for a profit and decided by the publisher. Um, so I think there's some some things again there that I that I know that I struggle with. Mm. Go ahead, Natasha. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, um, both of you. So, um, did That's, you want? Did you want yeah, to this, Spencer? Yeah, I just wanted to to throw this in there as again, um, maybe some of you at your institutions, your libraries have a, a tool to create these research guides, um, and it's, it's um, again just one of those sort of things that I that I think about. Um, our anti-racism guide um, is used by one of our instructors who teaches a couple cohort programs where those students actually go in there um, to that guide and, and do do some research and then facilitate conversation out of there on their own 
um, um, in webinars uh, with their with their student colleagues or their student peers. And then we, um, um, instead of um, Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, we re re renamed our celebration Latinx Heritage Month to be more inclusive um, and uh, made um, this information and these presentations available to not only the college community, but the local community that supports us. Um, and so again, um, you know, a tool that's easily accessible, easily used, um, but um, oftentimes we speak to the product name um, without questioning that. Okay, great, thanks. So um, that's sort of our uh, initial thoughts and, and observations based on our, you know, some differences, I think, between our experiences, but obviously some overlapping ideas as well. Um, and as I said at the start, um, when we were thinking about putting this panel together, one of the um, strategies that we thought might be effective were, were to come up with some questions. And some of these we've already touched on. So I, I'll ask the panel like where, where you wanna go next. Um, we've got about, um, I'd say about 10 minutes before we open it up for um, uh, audience questions, but maybe we could tackle one or two of the discussion questions that are on this list. So we have two pages of them. So where do you wanna go? Hmm. Well, maybe I can just to mention um, briefly, because one of the questions asks about this, in fact, the top one on this list, what level of participation with faculty was taken by administrators in making contingency plans? Was it decided top down with little teacher input? And <clears throat> I'm at one of the universities that um, wanted to prioritize a face-to-face -face experience. Um, you know, and <clears throat> they would always start every paragraph with, well, of course, health is our first concern. But we're going to go ahead, um, you know, because there's a lot of, there, you know, there were big deal financial stakes. The, the main problem was that the, at least initially, and for a lot of it, I mean, the process was very top down. And so at the, at the university level, input from faculty was um, secondary. I know other schools had um, better responses to this, maybe more democratic responses to this. Um, um, so I don't know if that's common with other people's experience. And I think what Michelle, what you're talking about in the, in the high school environment is, is, you know, kind of terrifying. One of the first comments that came up on the chat I saw was about uh, recording and mm -hmm. it just struck me and I don't even know what the, cause you know, the law is very state by state in terms of recording. And in a lot of states, you actually need permission of all the parties before you record. So I wonder how much of that is actually like, in Oklahoma, it's a, where I'm at, it's a one party permission, but in states that are, you know, multi-party permission, I'm wondering if that's actually kind of a legal problem that you would actually have to get your students permission in order to do that. But just a thought about, you know, kind of how this uh, change has been structured, which, you know, at other institutions, again, there's been a variety of responses, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is a really um, interesting idea because uh, unlike Oklahoma, Ralph, in Illinois, you do have to get both parties um, permission in order to record. And um, this was a discussion amongst faculty at my institution originally, but it quickly got sidestepped, I think, by um, uh, the, the, the college lawyers got involved. And then um, because first of all, it was going to be um, um, sort of offered as a question to the students. Um, but that that quickly got run over when, um, you know, it, if you don't get the right answer, then what do you, what do you do? So, um, yeah, I think it is <laughs> right when you don't get the answer you want. But I think there's a common theme, isn't there, through all of these things. It's, it con consistently goes back to issues of control and power. And, um, you know, over and over again, whether it's the camera in your class, whether it's turned on or not, I mean, it's, it, I mean, I think in some ways it's really laid bare, at least for me, it's really laid bare some of these things that I knew existed, of course, and go on. Um, but I think it really reveals those things. And I think that perhaps gives us an opportunity to, to do something with that because they are revealed so starkly. Yeah, and from my perspective, you know, I think faculty were given, you know, five different, five modality choices. For their courses you know but does a student know what hybrid synchronous asynchronous mm -hmm. what does that mean how does how are how does that work um you know so we're sort of working at the same time to support students to understand that um because they don't know you know eventually what you know they signed up for a course they don't know what they're they're actually getting into there mm. yeah um i'll just add 
um, to this question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking already to like next year or whenever we can, you know, safely all come back to the classroom and we don't have to thin out our numbers. Um, and what's like, what is that process back going to going to look like? And I think five months ago, I felt really hopeful that this was a time because all of these structural issues are laid bare. I was feeling very hopeful that we can't go back. Like we, we have to like, we have to reflect on what happened and think of something new together. And I have to say now, October 17th, I'm really not feeling very optimistic about that because I, I think because everyone is so overloaded, so exhausted, this is really not a very positive experience, I don't think, for educators or students. Um, I mean, I think that there are some positives that are, that are for some people that are surfacing, but in general, this is exhausting. And I, I just worry that on the other side of this, it's gonna be like, okay, can we just go back to the way that it was? Like, I know, I knew how to do that. Um, and so I, you know, I, I don't know what we can do to like set ourselves up for, um, I, I don't know, a, a collective reflection that, um, can be, um, I, I don't know, that can help us get to where we all really want, we would prefer to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear your point, Michelle, and uh, you know, it's highly unusual for me to be the optimistic one amongst the four of us anyway. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know what's come over me, but I think in part, I was inspired by the, the, the keynote this morning, the, you know, the panel this morning, and thinking about you know, there are lots of other people. And I think part of it is that we, we all feel isolated in our own institutions. And we tend to be at the fringes, ideologically, often at, at these institutions. And um, I'm, I'm struck, but I think about, um, I don't think Ruha Benjamin said this, but it is quoted in her book where she talked about hope be, hope is a practice. And again, this is quite uncharacteristic for me, but um, I, I, I mean, I think, I, I think there's some truth to that, isn't there? Like that if you don't, then you just, you almost lay down and, and give up. And um, I know there's only a certain amount of energy that everybody can use on this, but I think if we don't try to challenge it in some small way, and I'll just give you an example. So at my institution, the, there was a, there's a group on campus that sort of is watching out for the students who are failing, you know, everybody's got one of these groups. And um, so they asked, they came to the faculty and asked if we could um, together as a faculty, just issue a statement of support to the students. We have five weeks left in, this, in the semester that said something along the lines of, you know, um, we're here for you. Not everybody's got the same policies or whatever, but basically we know this is a tough time. We recognize the conditions that you're in. And, you know, basically we're here to support you. They couldn't, it failed like faculty would not sign their uh, on board for that and that mm -hmm. to me is shameful absolutely shameful yeah so hope is a practice <laughs> my last slide so look we're at uh, 13 minutes past the hour should we I, I know there's some movement in the chat should we see if there's um some questions or if anybody wants to chime in um, with your questions. There's definitely some comments, um, but I would be interested to know if people have questions that this time is yours. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear any parallel experiences or what one, like just one thing I'll, I'll, I'll suggest just that because it's tangentially related to what a, a few of us have talked about, which is the idea that I think discussions about issues like privacy are really important. Um, that's something I've learned actually a lot. And this kind of goes back to Natasha's um, optimistic kind of cynicism or cynical kind of optimism, however you'd want to frame it. Um, because in, in one of the, a recent discussion I had with some graduating seniors, we talk about privacy and, you know, their data being turned into commodities, you know, sort of without their knowing. They're growing up in a world where that's, they, they, the way that they phrase it is, this is how things work. So, ah, eh, you know, um, but, and, and of course the, uh, the consequences of that are, are, you know, substantial. 
So I think, you know, continuing that discussion and drilling down a little bit, even with something as kind of fatally flawed as the Social Dilemma documentary mm -hmm. that draws attention to some of those issues, it's got a lot of ucky in it, but it, but it does kind of provoke thinking. I think it's really interesting how they shot all of the most or most of the uh, tech specialists if they were being imprisoned. That was, I thought, really a weird choice for the documentary, but mm -hmm. I haven't heard the director talk about that yet, but I think it's kind of interesting thing. I think those discussions about privacy and actually so that students understand that that privacy is their choice and it's their possession and it's their, you know, that's something that they own, that they that they can take ownership over. Mm -hmm. So let's do like what we do in class, which is have an awkward silence by, uh, and force somebody to ask a, ask a question, right? This is typically what we do in these in these formats. It's called wait time, Natasha. Oh, okay, sorry. Wait time. <laughs> I can give a, uh, some comments. First of all, thanks to everyone um, on this panel. Really interesting. And um, I'm I teach at a, a small uh, college of Penn State University, and our students are 57% um, minority, 80% first generation college students. And we just, I'm a faculty fellow, which means I'm kind of, um, I play a lead role in faculty development. And we just have these ongoing conversations about, you know, the issues of having students be engaged, but not in, in invading their privacy, asking them to have cameras on. And, you know, I was just teaching to a blank screen. And as it's just so hard. I, I did ask my students finally, um, it's hard like not to be coercive. I can't mandate that they have cameras on, but I, I talked to them about, um, since my courses uh, are in the communication department, about nonverbal communication, you know, and how important it is. And, and you know, at first I asked them, so what's the difference between just texting somebody and talking to them face to face? And so they all started, you know, saying, oh, well, you get so much out of facial expressions. And it's like, yes, turn your cameras on. <laughs> so I'm getting like a, a few of them to do it. And that's really enough. I also bought this whiteboard behind me, if you can see it. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't put, I mean, I don't put up anything there. The students tell me they can see it well. So I get up and move around. But um, okay, that's just in terms of trying to get the students engaged. But we're just really struggling with um, not, not all students have access. I have students who are sitting in their cars um, participating in class because they have uh, young siblings at home or they're just in situations where they have no privacy. Um, and yet at the same time, I'm just, oh, it's just, it's just such a struggle, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. like, I'm wondering how, um, what you, like, you know, you mentioned, you know, we're talking about not, we can't force them to turn cameras on, at least at Penn State, we can't. How do you, convince them that it's 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 important to do i mean we know nonverbal communication interaction we can list all these reasons why but how do any of you have you had luck with with ways to really have them turn their you know want to be engaged and talk to each other yeah um i mean i think this is um they're learning as we're learning like and i i don't think i mean i think patience is is really key here and i feel the same way you do i can relate to exactly what you're saying but i've also been struck by the ways in which students are taking advantage of the different ways that they can interact so there's a lot going on in the chat um we we did we put the the emoji thing on the the google meet and then we're having a conversation as well and i think you know it's just like in class there's some people who would prefer you know talk in the chat not really say what they have to say out loud and i think so i think that there is a, a little bit of a curve in terms of everybody getting a little bit more comfortable with this but um, yeah, I think that multimodal way of expressing themselves is, you know, even though you're saying an emoji, that's still feedback. You know, if everybody has their camera off and I'm asking them, hey, do you, you know, do you, what questions do you have? Or are you with me? Anybody out there? And I get a little thumbs up, you know, it's better than just complete silence in the that, dark screen. That's what I was getting before, but I don't know if we find that some of the students, maybe because this particular class I'm thinking about is a lot of of a freshman first year students right and um yeah that's still uh they're, they're just maybe not confident yet 
and they don't, they don't put, they don't, they're not confident in terms of interacting with each other. I use breakout rooms, but I mean, it's getting better. It's, it's, I'm not, I'm not a complete cynic about it at all. I had to teach workshops all summer after I was trained of how to do this, you know, to my faculty. But at the same time, I'm, I'm like positive about it and just thinking, okay, we can, we have to do this. We'll find a way. It's a challenge. And then sometimes I'm just so exhausted and frustrated. And I, I think again, that, that was already mentioned. That's kind of how we're all, we're all feeling about it. Yeah, I think Spencer, did you want to jump in? It looked like Renee well, wanted to jump in and then Rob said he had some ideas. Oh yeah, I was just going to say, I was going to help you facilitate that. So who's, whoever is up next, if Renee wants yeah. to go and then Renee, Rob. you look like you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what a Hi. great conversation. Thank you so much for uh, doing this. It's absolutely okay to be wherever we are on this. I've I'm, I'm been reflecting on how, since I've been teaching online for so long, I long ago gave up on Zoom meetings for undergraduates. Okay, that's just like not happening. What instead I found is really powerful is to use um asynchronous uh, uh opportunities for them to interact with each other so every week my students i force them to have a date we like to do speed dating every week every week my students get partnered up with somebody who they have to have a conversation with and produce some media reflecting on whatever we've been reading right whatever our topic of the week is and Students actually, it, because it's like speed dating, it's responsive to like their developmental uh, <laughs> needs, right? They're they, be, performing the role of student on a Zoom is really a drag. It just is. And yet it's great for a small group communication, like three to five people. It's really great for one-on-one. -on -one. It's got some purposes but i feel like because we're still thinking about it as a classroom mm -hmm. that's where it goes back to how our our how the paradigms we hold on to in one medium like interfere with innovation in the new medium and so i just don't use zoom as a classroom that's just not it, it doesn't serve that purpose very well for me there are so many other ways i can get students to interact with each other I, I don't want to use one that's essentially that poorly replicates an actual classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I would say that some of us, though, are bound by our institutions that we have to meet synchronously. So we don't have the option. We don't have the autonomy to decide yeah. that we're going. Yeah. And, that, and that's part of the structure, yeah. isn't it, as yeah. well? Well, it absolutely is. And I think that's where uh, advocacy on the part of faculty and, and pushing for faculty autonomy is really, really important. And of course, that's easy to say from my point of view as a person at the top of the food chain. But I think in a way we have to be we have to be able to provide new uh, pedagogical models for our leaders. Nobody knows what they're doing right now. But actually, everybody participating in this conference is like ahead of the game. So we have to be uh we have to help our administrators right in a way we have to help them because they yeah. don't know uh, oh i just love what you said though about having the students obviously you know like produce something um but i teach synchronously and like i say here's my you know me trying to bring my old-fashioned classroom back in but i don't use it for like lecturing or anything I, when students have ideas i just throw words up there so that they can see how everything comes together but that would be a way to take the asynchronous work and, you know, put it together up there. So combining things. Yeah, Rob, I think wanted to get in and I think Ralph had something to say as well. So let's go that, that right. Uh, Rob? Hi everyone, um, Rob Williams from Vermont. R Renee, typically brilliant, thank you. Um, I just had four suggestions in response to listening to this really interesting conversation based on my own experiences of the past couple of months. Number one, um, I found that having students write handwritten um, handwritten notes in the class, I have, I'm teaching flex hybrid. So I have half of the students in front of me and the other half on a Zoom call at any given time. So having them all, whether they're remote or in class, kind of track the conversation that we're having 
and then take out their photo app on their phone and take a picture of their notes at the end of the week and put those up on Canvas holds everybody accountable for being engaged, whether their cameras are on or not. So that's nice. Um, mm. Number two, um, having students lead presentations, they prepare them in advance and then they, you can share the screen around as I'm sure we all know. So we empower students through the technology to share their responses to readings and take an active leadership role in cracking open conversations in the class has been very helpful and they post those links open onto the canvas so other students have access to them as we build the course. Um, number three, um, doing uh, research projects that we crowd critique every week together, whether they're remote or in person. So they're writing, let's say, um, a research paper. Every week they share a new draft of a new paragraph and we take some time in class to have each of them present on their findings and critique that together. And they actually uh, compile the critiques in the form of notes on the platform. So then they go back and they can revise having collected crowdsourced um, feedback from the students. And then finally, um, watching uh, multimedia films, we mentioned The Social Dilemma, as problematic as that film is, it's, you know, for younger audiences, I think it's kind of a useful way to crack open, you know, what's going on here with surveillance, capitalism, et cetera. But watching those in small, um, small 10 minute chunks, stopping, having conversations together about it, collecting notes, et cetera, building out sort of a document that we share together is really helpful. So those are four things that I found have been working pretty well. Um, and I hope that's useful. I appreciate the, the struggle. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Ralph? Um, I just, you know, and not to be boring and repetitious, but I think that in a lot of cases, some of these issues are things we should be talking to students about so that they are developing mastery and control over the technology they're being subjected to, oppressed by, however you'd want to think about it. That again, it's like, it's something that can be talked about with them. And so that they can kind of think about what are the advantages and disadvantages of the way these things are being approached. And, you know, what are the, um, what are the consequences for them um, in you know whatever medium they're 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 interacting with, because um, they have you know it's their ex it's in their experience right so it's and and it's you know again the free area idea that since it's in their experience by just asking it more critical questions then that will potentially and hopefully give them more power over it that's my hope anyway. Yeah, and on that point, I, I think even like asking students like why like. Or, you know, and maybe not everyone wants to speak to why they don't want to turn their camera on or why this or that isn't working, but even just asking, how's it going? Are you, how, how is this experience for you? And um, I think that can, you know, even just the act of asking is something that maybe they're not even used to. And like to, to think that their feedback could sort of impact the environment, I think is pretty powerful. And something that's very common in K-12, I don't know if it is in college but setting norms together and it's not that's not a set of classroom rules but together as a learning community determining okay what do we need to have in place so that everyone feels comfortable everyone's able to participate and i wonder you know though there are some things that are top-down mandates if like where are the corners where are the opportunities for co-constructing a community um together on zoom or wherever else yeah, and I think just connected to that, Michelle, I put it in the chat, but um, this is the first year I annotated my syllabus with my students together. And I, and I was really shocked and impressed at their level of participation and how they talk to each other independently of things that I put down. And um, it was really successful. If you haven't looked that up, um, Remy Kallir, I think, has written a number of blog posts about it. Um, and yeah, that was super successful in my classes this year. So. Like I said, I was a little bit shocked about it, but yeah, we have to find these spaces where there is some room for some agency, for some collaboration, for some investment, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think part of the problem is that students have spent their lives, as I did when I was a student, um, feeling like you're a passive, like all your, your only job is to like regurgitate back what you learned. And I think so for a lot of students, especially first generation students, this is a, a radical really revolutionary idea 
that your voice is important, that your opinion matters somehow, and that you can co-construct something. I mean, just to even get that idea across, I think, mm -hmm. is can be challenging in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Don't let me have the last word. That was a pretty good last word. <laughs> So maybe we should just uh, thank everybody for their time and coming into the space today. It's lovely to see everybody. And um, yeah, we really, we really appreciate the, the feedback and yeah. yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.